You can take a seat, you can have a seat. Would you turn to your Bibles in Mark chapter nine? We'll get there in just one second. Go to verse 14, verse 14. Hey, listen, if there's seats open next to you, this place is packed. If there's seats next to you and you're okay with someone sitting next to you, just kind of maybe wave and and our ushers in the back are doing as best as they can to find seats for people so they can look and hey, there's there's some seats open here and there so we'll get people sat next to you. We're beginning right now a five-week series about prayer. And so for the next five weeks, we're gonna unpack a story found in Mark chapter nine, beginning in verse 14 through 29. And in conjunction with this series, we're starting a true midweek gathering and it's a time of prayer. Now here's what we're gonna do in this midweek gathering. We're gonna actually teach you how to pray. Many people here, many people have walked their Christian life or you're brand new to the Christian faith. You're like, I don't really know how to pray. And so we're gonna teach you, how do you intercede in prayer? How do you fast in prayer? How do you have contemplative prayer or breathing prayer or fellowship prayer? So we're gonna actually teach you these and give you a space to actually put this into practice in your life. And I'm gonna challenge you to be here for these next five weeks in this series. I think this is the most important series we've done all year. So be here for the next five weeks, orient your life around gathering with God's people here and then on Wednesdays. Parents, if you have children, bring your children. If you don't have uh, like the space to bring them and your child really needs the, the 15 hours of sleep, that's okay, God loves you, we love you. Get a babysitter, come and get a reimbursement form and we'll reimburse you for that babysitter. That's how much we want you to be here and we think it's important. College students, young adults, families, orient your life around the people of God, amen? We're gonna gather together and experience the power of God and the presence of God in our lives. All right, let's go to Mark chapter nine. The title of my message today is God's Power in Prayer. Mark chapter nine, story in the life of Jesus. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, him being Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and he grinds his teeth and he becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And he answered them, "O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And when they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And 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 it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can. All things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, if you have a pen, a highlighter, mark that prayer down. I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse. So that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he he had entered the house, the disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer and fasting. This is the word of the Lord. The Christian life is a life of surrender. And the central practice of that life is prayer. The aim of your life and the aim of my life, the aim of the Christian life is to become more like Jesus. That's why we exist as a church. We exist as a church to see people made alive in Christ, which is both point and process. What I mean that by that is we wanna see every single person who is a part of this church come to the point where they recognize that Jesus is Lord and Savior of their life, that apart from him, they are sinners destined for an eternity without God and they give their lives to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But from that point on, they're in a process to become more like Jesus. Now, if we are to live as Jesus, we have to also live like Jesus. And Jesus was a man of great power because Jesus was a man of great prayer. In fact, the disciples could have asked Jesus to teach them anything. And Jesus had done some cool stuff by this point. 
He had walked on water. That's pretty cool, I think. You know, brown people don't like to get in the water. I prefer to walk on the water. That sounds cool to me. <laughs> he could take some bread and he could lift it up and break it and, and feed thousands. That's pretty cool. I'd like to do that. I got three sons that eat a lot. I'd love to take one loaf, break it, and then feed them for the rest of their lives. I would love that. Jesus has casted out demons. He's healed the sick. But the one thing they ask Jesus how to do is they say, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? Teach us to pray. And why do they ask Jesus this? Because they saw in the life of Jesus a man who operated with supernatural power. The kind of power that was able to withstand temptation. Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, but he never sinned, not once. He had the power to resist the devil. Jesus had the power to stand against the oppression that was coming against him. He had the power to forgive those who were persecuting him. He had the power to forgive those who were violently nailing him to a cross. He had the power to always, always live in the unity and the love of God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus had the power to never forget who he was and why he came. They knew he was a man with power. In fact, if you read the Gospel of Luke, beginning in chapter four, it says in verse 17, I believe, it says in verse 17 that the moment that Jesus arrived on the scene, verse 14, the moment he arrived on the scene, that he came in the power of the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 32 that as he began teaching in the synagogues, that the people were astonished that he taught with power. He taught with such power. It says in verse 36 that, that with authority and power, he commanded the unclean spirits and they came out. The spirits listened to him. In Luke chapter five, verse 14, it says that, he, that the power to cast out demons and to heal was with him. That's power. And if you read the story of Jesus, especially in the Gospel of Luke, you can see that virtually everything is preceded with prayer in the life of Jesus. Before he chooses his disciples, prayer. Before he goes to the cross, prayer. He was always in prayer. Now, prayer in our day and age is something that is often talked about, but very little understood. It's often referenced, but practiced very little. It's almost as if it's from that scene in the movie, the classic movie, the Princess Bride. Inconceivable. 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 You keep saying that word. I don't think you know what that word means. See, in culture, we pray a lot, don't we? When there's a natural disaster, when tragedy strikes, heck, when an athlete gets hurt, pray for so-and-so. Hashtag pray for so-and-so. It really just means, hey, maybe just wish them well. Maybe just let your heart move, move towards them and, and you're thinking about them. Well, sadly, in Christian culture, in Christian homes, in the church, prayer is no longer the central practice of the people of God. It's sort of a perfunctory activity. Hey, before we eat, we, we gotta pray. And usually if, if I'm in a gathering with people, they always ask me to pray. Well, you're, you're, you're the pastor, you should pray. When I go to a birthday party, hey, you're, you're the pastor, you should pray. As if I have some, some closer connection with God than, than other people do. Listen, most people on our staff are, are more educated than I am. You should ask them to pray. They have actual master's degrees. I just read a lot of books. <laughs> so technically, legally, like they're closer to God than I am. I always get asked to pray. Sort of perfunctory, isn't it? it or, or it's transitory. I just made up that word. <laughs> but it sounds good. It's like, hey, we got we to get the worship team off the stage, and we got to get the pastor on the stage, and it's got to be seamless. So pastor pray with one eye open and you're looking to see if they've gone down yet. And then at the closing, you keep one eye open to see if they're coming up yet. It's all transition stuff. It's so the, it's so the stage hands can move things around and you open your eyes, you're like, wow, where did the podium come from? It's like a magically appeared out of heaven. Or it's this ritualistic thing that we do. We really don't believe it. It's like, well, we're supposed to. So we just do it. But prayer is the means to power. The word power occurs over 120 times in the New Testament alone. In the Greek, it's the word dunamis. It means God's ability to achieve what God wants you to do. It means the ability to achieve through God's ability, power. And it is necessary 
if you are to become like Jesus. It is necessary for your formation. In other words, if you are going to become like Jesus, if you are going to become who God has called you to be, wherever you are on this journey of formation to become more like Jesus, it is impossible to do without prayer. It doesn't matter how many master's degrees you have. It doesn't matter how many books you read. It doesn't matter how many conferences you go to. It doesn't matter how much Christian radio you listen to. It doesn't matter how many church services you go to. It doesn't matter who your friends are. It doesn't matter who your parents are. You cannot become who God wants you to be without prayer. In fact, that is the number one thing my wife and I teach our three sons, how to pray. They've gotten so good at it, they remind us if we haven't prayed with them at night. And sometimes we have prayed with them and they come back to remind us we need to pray more, come back and pray with us more. We want our sons to be warriors of prayer, our family to be marked by prayer. Because if your family is marked by prayer, if your life is marked by prayer, you are a person whose life is marked and filled with the power of God. Why is this important? Why is prayer important? Because prayer, what is prayer? Prayer is both the access point and the pathway of heaven's influence on the earth. It is both the access point and the pathway of heaven's influence on the earth. Now on the one hand, prayer is personal. We're told in the scriptures that we should seek the the quiet place, the secret place with the Lord and pray. We're also told in the scriptures that we should pray in fellowship with one another, in deep fellowship with one another. Now, more often than not, when we get together with our Christian friends, we talk about our problems or we vent about our problems. We talk about the people that are bothering us. And lately I've been asking a lot of Christians that I meet with, are you talking more about this or praying more about this? If you were to calculate your hours about this particular situation, talking or praying, we're told to pray in the gathering of God's people. And when we do that, we are communing. We're not communicating. We are communing with the God of the universe, the God who is right now holding the world in the palm of his hands, the God who is breathing life into your body, the God who is sustaining all things. You are invited to commune with God. Prayer is also the means by which we hear from God and we walk in obedience to him. Prayer is the means by which we ask God and move God to intervene into human history. My parents are very educated people. My parents came to this country with nothing. And the thing about my parents that convinced me that what they believe is real is that my parents are not strategic people. My parents are not planning people. My my parents are prayerful people. From the time I was younger to this day, when I wake up at five in the morning and I go down, I find my parents on their knees praying, 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 praying in everything. My dad has never asked for anything. My dad has, my mom and dad have started churches, been missionaries overseas in places and cultures that are not like theirs. They have traveled around the world. My dad has preached to millions of people. They have started an orphanage for girls in India that we all support as a church. And every one of those is preceded and sustained in prayer. My parents are always calling to pray with me. Every birthday, every birthday, my parents will text me, when can we call and pray with you? When can we call and pray with you? Now they do send me money and it's gotten lower as years have gone by. It's gotten a lot lower. And every year my dad would say, Nudope, I'm sending you $200, go buy a nice suit. And I would go buy shoes. (laughs) Now it's less. I can't even buy shoes with the amount of money they send me anymore. But they call me to pray. And they always begin with, Lord, from the moment of his conception. I'm like, I don't want to know about that moment. I don't want to pray about that moment. I don't want to think about that moment. So I want to know about it. Our anniversary, on our wedding anniversary, they always call to pray with us. Why? Because in the words of the immortal MC Hammer, you gotta pray just to make it today. I used to practice that dance and everything. I used to know it, I used to know it. Well, in the words of a better theologian, Martin Luther, for a Christian not to pray is the same as to be alive but not breathe. Our life should be marked 
by prayer. The great tragedy, friends, of our day is this, that many who are Christians and call themselves Christians, who have at their fingertips information they can receive, they have all the access to resources that people in other parts of the world would only dream about, and yet we live as a perpetually powerless people. Why? Because power, friends, does not come from information. Power does not come from money. Power does not come from influence. Power does not come from resources. Power comes through surrender. And prayer, true prayer, true prayer, is an act of surrender. It's a fascinating story in the life of Jesus, isn't it? Jesus comes down from the mountain of transfiguration with three of his disciples. He comes into a scene and he finds the scribes arguing with his disciples. Jesus enters the scene and they seem to be arguing about something. And Jesus says, hey, what, what are you arguing about? And so you can only tell that people are starting to say, well, Jesus, your disciples over here were trying to do something. I don't know why they always sound South, but, but in, in my mind, the, the scribes always sound Southern. And so they're like, Jesus, your disciples try. And, and the disciples are like, oh, no, 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 Jesus, Jesus, uh, Jesus, see, see, Jesus what, 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 what had happened was, uh, we was trying to find you and you were nowhere to be found. And so we thought, well, we could probably do this. We've seen you do this before. So we tried to do it, but it wasn't working. And then somewhere out of the crowd, this, this, this hand sort of goes up and he says, teacher, 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 I was looking for you. See, my son, and you have no idea how old his son is. We know he's a boy. Typically a, a boy in Jewish culture was around the age of 13. So maybe he was 13, maybe he was 15, maybe he was 20. We have no idea. He says, my boy. My boy has been possessed with a spirit. And, and he foams at the mouth, he becomes, he becomes rigid and he, and he convulses, he can't speak. Which means I, I can't take him to the temple to worship. I can't go anywhere in public because he's unclean. If anyone touches him, then, then they're unclean as well. So, so we're sort of stuck, Jesus. And, and I asked your disciples to help, but they were unable. What's fascinating is that word unable in the Greek actually means they had no power. They were unable. So Jesus says, hey, how long has this been happening to him? He says, since childhood. Since childhood, no one could touch him. Since childhood, he's been this way. You begin to see the, the compassion of Jesus moving towards this boy. It's an incredible scene. I love this scene because the father is actually looking for Jesus. And instead, he finds his disciples. He was looking for Batman, and he got Robin. I had a friend in, in third grade, and no, sorry, in seventh grade, in seventh grade, we were playing cricket in the rain. Y'all don't know about cricket, but it's a fun game in the rain. We're playing in the rain. And my friend is running towards the wickets and he trips and he falls and his elbow somehow ended up from on this side to this side. And his name, I kid you not, his name was Joy. There was no joy in that moment. <laughs> he is screaming in pain. And so we're all, in, we're seventh grade or we're just like, what do we do? We're all kind of around him. And one of our friends says, move, get out of the way, get out of the way. My dad's a doctor. And I'm like, well, then get your dad over here. What are you doing? Like, did you go to medical school? Do you watch Grey's Anatomy? Like, do you, I mean, get a doctor over here. It's like the father is looking for the man with power. And instead he got the people with no power. They're looking for the man who can actually do something about their situation. They're looking for a man named Jesus because they had heard there was a man named Jesus. He was a rabbi, but he was different than other rabbis. This rabbi could walk on water. This rabbi could heal the sick. He could make the mute speak and the lame dance and the blind see, the deaf hear. Th this rabbi would, would take food and he would break it and he would feed thousands of people. We need that guy. We need the man with power. And instead they find the people that have no power. Isn't it funny how often in our lives when situations come up, we go to the people with no power. Usually in our world, that's called gossip. We go to the person who has no power, and what ends up happening? We're all arguing about the lack of results. Meanwhile, the man with power is waiting to be approached. He finally sees Jesus, and Jesus says, bring the boy to me. Oh, it's getting good now. The father's like, I've been waiting for this moment. Just touch him, and we'll be on our way. But Jesus doesn't do this. 
He says, hey, how long has this been happening to him? How long has this been happening to him? Now, you gotta ask yourself the question. Why is Jesus asking this question? This is the Lord Jesus. He's the one, according to Colossians, who spoke all things into motion. He's the one, according to Colossians, who is holding the world in the palm of his hands. He is sustaining all things. Why does the creator of the universe, who knows how many hairs are on your head, need to know how long this has been happening? Does Jesus not know how long this has been happening? Well, Jesus knows. So why is he asking the question? Because he's trying to get the Father to come to a place where he's willing to admit his inability, his weakness. There's many different kinds of prayer. There's prayers of gratitude, thanksgiving, adoration, praise, worship, confession, consecration, intercession, spiritual warfare, prayers for petition and provision, prayers for lament and grieving, prayers of supplication. And all of these prayers really is the evidence of our inability, subconscious or not. There is something in our hearts that tells us, hey, you don't have any power to do really anything about this. And so we begin to ask God. Now, isn't it interesting that we live in a culture, especially in the American West, where we're not supposed to have any weaknesses? No weaknesses. On dating apps, it's all your strengths, isn't it? I love hiking, and I love overpriced coffee, and I love kombucha. It never says anything like, I'm overly sensitive, I'm really critical and defensive. <laughs> it never says that. And if you grow up in the business world, you're told how to do interviews really well. You following me, any of you in the business world? And you get, you get asked an interview, hey, what's your biggest weakness? Oh, I'm a perfectionist. <laughs> no, you're not. You're deeply insecure. That's, what you, that's your biggest weakness. <laughs> hey, what's, what's your greatest weakness? It's like, oh, I just, I'm a workaholic and I put work first all the time. No, it's because you have a deep need to belong somewhere and you find it in work. And there's something about money that satisfies you and creates a life of sufficiency for you that God doesn't. See, we're told, we're told to hide our weaknesses. Uh, we have friends in this church who work for Gallup, and Gallup, they do many different things. They're, they're a really great organization. One of the things they're known for is strength finders. But I have never taken the weakness finder test. I've never taken that test. Where, where is my weakness? And so we're, we're told to hide it and suppress it or hire around it. Forget about your weakness. Just hire people who are strong at things that you're not strong in. But here's what I want you to know. God wants to bring you to a place where you are willing to admit your weakness and your inability because there are some things that God will not do. There is some power that God is withholding until you are willing to confess that you need it. In other words, why do we pray the specifics of where we are weak? Because unless you confess the specifics of where you are weak, you will never experience the substance of God's power in your life. And some of you right now, you're in situations, you're in seasons where you are struggling with deep frustration. Frustration at the world around you. Frustration at your relationship status. Some of you are really wrestling with deep familial wounds and pain and brokenness, loneliness. Some of you are really struggling with addiction. Now you won't call it that because you only look at porn once a week. So you won't call it an addiction. It's just a problem. It's just a problem. You won't get rid of your phone, won't get rid of your, won't get rid of your computer, won't ask anyone to help you. You read a couple blogs to maybe help figure this out. It's not an addiction. You have these real situations in your life, but what I found more often than not in my 20 years of being a professional Christian is that Christians are excellent at hiding their struggles. Excellent at it. We are professional hiders. I'm not preaching to anybody today. We professionally hide our weaknesses. Why? Now, it could be shame. There could be things in your life where things have happened to you, either by decisions you made or decisions that were made for you. And those have deeply marked your life. And there's a shame of, and if people only knew, if God only knew, what would they think of me? How would they treat me? Would I be viewed different? 
would I no longer be welcome? Because many of you have had that experience, haven't you? You've, you've tried to share it, only to find that even a little bit of vulnerability was met with more rejection and betrayal. And that shame was dug deeper and deeper and deeper. Many of you live in, in families of secrecy, where, where one sibling knows another thing, but you can't tell anyone else. And so there's constant secrecy kind of moving around in your family. And that breeds a lot of shame and guilt into your soul. Many of you, if I can be really honest, it's not the shame, it's the pride. No, 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 God, I got this. God, I don't know if you know this, but I have a master's degree in theology. God, I don't know if you know this, but I'm on my way to get my master's in Old Testament theology, so you know I'm serious about my faith. God, I don't know if you know this, but I got she reads truth and he reads truth and they read truth and we read truth. And God, I got every app in the world. I got all the software in the world. God, I got this. God, I don't know if you know this, but I got money. I got a job. I got friends. God, I don't know if you know this, but I live in America. We don't need you. And here's, the, here's what I found in my own life. As long as you are more concerned with your reputation and as long as you are more concerned about other people's perception of you, you will never experience the power of God in your life. Never, never, not even an inch of it. But the power of God is available for you. And when you are willing to confess your weakness, when you are willing to confess your inability, then God begins to move. Have you noticed in our prayers that we do most of the asking? God, would you please, please let the bear start Justin Fields today. Lord, would you please do something about the evil that exists in Green Bay and just sort of obliterate that town. They are like Sodom and Gomorrah. Lord, Lord, would you please, God, I'm begging you, can she please break up with that guy because I've been waiting forever and if she only met me, she would know I'm the next thing best to Jesus. <laughs> Lord, would you please help me get that job? Lord God, would you just kind of, are you part of the Red Sea? Could you part 25 for me? I'm trying to get home in a decent time today. <laughs> Have you noticed in our prayer, we do all the asking. You know what's interesting? Gabby, you're interested. No one else is interested. I'm gonna just come talk to you. <laughs> Gabby, you know what's interesting? Jesus, you know how many questions Jesus has asked? Take a guess in the scriptures. No, 183, close. A for, a for effort, Gabby, A for effort. Jesus has asked 183 questions. Now, youth pastor, how many did Jesus answer? Three, close, 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 close. Now, how many questions, let's get someone on this side. How many questions did Jesus ask? Any clues? No, he, Jesus was asked 183. Jesus asked 307 questions. Jesus asks more questions than he was asked. Isn't it interesting? In our prayer, we're always doing the asking. Instead of asking, Jesus, what are you asking? Jesus, what are, what are you asking in this moment? Because Jesus wants to bring you to the place where you can see your limitation. Because until you see your limitation, you will never experience God beginning to move. In other words, when you come to the end of yourself, God is just beginning. He is just beginning. Now God's saying, oh, you're willing to admit it? Now, let's get to work. Let's get to work. Let's see what we can do about this situation. So the father says, Jesus, if you can do anything, which the exact translation is, if you have any power, if you have any power, can you feel that? And have you been there before? Jesus, if you could do anything, 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 because Jesus, I've tried counseling. I've taken him to therapy. I've taken him to the world's renowned doctors. I've taken him to, to group counseling. I've taken him to friends. I tried to get him to the temple, but they wouldn't let him in. I have tried everything. Jesus, if you can do anything. Jesus, I have tried everything to fight this loneliness. Can you do anything? Jesus, I have tried everything to rid myself of this temptation, this lust that I have in my heart, this pride that I have in my soul. Jesus, I have tried everything 
to win my son back, to win my daughter back, and they want nothing to do with me. Jesus, I've tried everything to forget about the abuse that was done to my body. Jesus, I've tried everything. Can you do anything? You feel that. You feel that honest prayer. And then Jesus says, if I can, exclamation point. In other words, Jesus is saying, if I have power, if I have power, well, all things are possible for those who believe. Believe in what? That power is both available and accessible. See, there's a difference between something being available and something being accessible. They're two very different things. When I first met my wife 15 years ago, we were on the same worship team together, and I heard, and I heard girls sing, and I was like, she is going to have my babies. <laughs> now, I had to find out if she was available, and I found out, oh, she is available. Then I had to ask, well, I have no access to her, so how do I weasel my way into her life? I just need a shot. You know, I'm just like, I'm just like Eminem, just give me one shot. You know, I just need one shot. And so how can I weasel? What do I have that I could weasel my way into this particular girl? And I realized, well, I have something. I have a car that I can't currently drive because my license was suspended. That's a different story for a different day. And she was visiting home and didn't have a car. And I thought, Lord, you have provided the means for me to enter into said relationship. So I just said innocently, hey, do you want to borrow my car while I'm gone? And, I'll, and then you, can you drop me off at the airport? Because I knew to O'Hare, that's a two-hour drive, y'all. <laughs> it's normally 15 minutes, but Chicago traffic, that's a two-hour drive. I'm like, I'm going to have a two-hour drive. And then, I, and then I'll say, when I land, I'll call you. Because it's just the nice thing to do. I, I need her to know that I'm safe, and I need her to know that I'm thinking about my car. So I'm just going to say, I'll call you. And that turned into an hour, turned into two hours, turned into, no, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, no, you hang up. <laughs> hello, 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 hello. <laughs> No, you hang up. No, no, you hang up. I just need to be accessible. See, something's available, but it's not accessible. Most of the problems in the world today are not ex- availability problems. They're accessibility problems. There is more than enough water to go around for everyone in the world. It's not that water is unavailable. You know that little water you drink and you leave it in the bottle and you throw it away? Half the world would kill for that little bottle. It's not an availability issue. It's an accessibility issue. Most of the hunger crisis in the world today, some of our food deserts and inner cities, they have no access to clean food. It's not an availability issue. It's an accessibility issue. God's power is available, but we don't access it. So Jesus says, do you believe? Do you believe that power from heaven is accessible? And you say, power for what, Jesus? How about the power for wisdom in a particular situation? How about the power for patience? How about the power against temptation? How about the power against addiction? How about the power to help you forgive those who have hurt you? How about the power against the forces of the devil that are against you? Power is available, but we're not using the cheat codes. See, when I was a kid growing up, we had these video games and they all had cheat codes. I was trying to teach my son about Nintendo, like true Nintendo, not Switch Nintendo, real Nintendo. They don't know about the struggle of Nintendo where you had to get the game out, get it out. Anyone know know what I'm talking about? Anyone feel, anyone still in counseling because of this? And you get it. And and I tell my son, we used to play this game called Contra, Super Contra. And you only get three lives, but there's a hundred lives available, but you got to know the access code. Anyone know the access code? Up, down, up, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, B, A, select, start, boom, hundred lives, access. (laughs) You can thank me later, children. Because all of your, the the, the power that is available for all of your problems in the natural are accessed through the supernatural. So every problem you face on earth, according to Jesus and according to the scriptures, are actually fought in the supernatural. This is why Paul says, hey, listen, your, your, your power, your problems are not against the things of flesh. They are in the powers and the principalities of darkness in the spiritual places. So everything you need in this life, all of your problems, the access and the power for that is in the supernatural. And God has designed prayer because prayer is God's delivery system for his divine power. Prayer is God's delivery system for his divine power. The question is, do you want access? See, the Christian life, friends, is a life of power. It is a life of supernatural power. 
And yet those who have all the access to God's available power to be working in them and through them and for them would rather walk or limp their way in the sufficiency of their own strength when infinite power is available to you. So the father cries out. He doesn't just say, yeah, 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 yeah. That power sounds good. No, he cries out to God. Now, many of you in this room don't have children. Lord willing, you will one day. But for those of you who have children, you know that when your child is sick, you will move heaven and earth to make that child well. Now, imagine if your child was so sick, and many of our friends are in this life. Their children are so sick, there's no medicine that can help them. This father cries out, he falls on his knees and he cries out, I believe, I believe that power is available, but God, would you help my unbelief? There is no more honest prayer in all of the scriptures than this unnamed man in Mark 9. God, I believe, I believe you can heal my marriage, but God, help me where I don't believe. God, I believe you can give my life purpose. God, I believe my identity can be found in you. But God, help me, help me, help me in my unbelief. God, I believe I can be free of this addiction. God, I believe I can be free of this unforgiveness. God, I believe I can be free of this profession. But God, please help my unbelief. And this is just pure conjecture. But I see Jesus moving towards this man. And with all the compassion of heaven, he puts his hands on the face of this man. And he says, now it's time to get to work. Because this sickness, this possession, he looks at the boy, this will no longer own you. This won't own you anymore. Jesus is waiting to put his hands on you and say, hey, this loneliness, it won't own you anymore. This abuse, it won't own you anymore. The pain you feel from your wandering children, it won't own you anymore. The darkness you feel in your soul, the bitterness that rages on, the betrayal that doesn't seem to let go, the abandonment you can't seem to get over, the unforgiveness that festers in your soul, the secrets that you've been living with for so long, the divorce that you thought defined you. He says, hey, this won't own you anymore. Let's get to work. And the power of God flows through the body of Jesus, through his words, touches this boy, and this boy is healed. Listen, friends, healing is available in your life. Real surrender, friends, real surrender is not to deny what you're going through and suppress it. Real surrender is not to just give up. I, just, I give up and I'm just gonna escape. I'm gonna leave this city I'm gonna leave this church, I'm gonna leave my friends, I'm gonna start over. That's not the Christian life. And real surrender, real surrender is to give in. Lord, I give in. I invite you into this place. The disciples, Jesus, why could we not cast it out? Like they really wanted to. You can, you can feel they wanted to. Jesus, why couldn't we cast it out? And he says, this can only be done in prayer. In other words, this can only be done if you're connected to the source. You're not the source, friends. You're the vessel. You have to be connected to the source. Prayer connects you to the source. My son the other day wanted to water. My, my wife is growing plants all over, and she has roses everywhere, and, and Kai, my four-year-old, says, Dad, can, can we go water the plants? And so he goes, and he takes the hose, and he starts to water it, and, he, and, he's, and he's pressing the right button. He's got the right hose, but no water's coming out. I mean, no water's coming out. He says, Dad, I, 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 no, I can't water it. And I was like, well, let's go look at where the hose is running to. And we go look and he said, well, son, you're not connected to the source. You gotta connect the hose to the water line and you gotta turn the water on. And when he did that, you would think that the second coming happened, the way he was like, oh, like water's coming out. Like his light, he saw in color for the first time. It was incredible. See, many of us want the power of God in our lives, but we're not willing to stay connected to the source. This is why the Bible says many things about prayer. One of the things it says in 1 Thessalonians is pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. Stay connected to the source because you're not the source. You're the vessel. I'm not the source. I'm the vessel. Stay connected to the source. The great F.B. Meyer, the Baptist preacher and evangelist said, 
The greatest tragedy of our day is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. Jesus wants us to be connected to the source. Church, the power of God, we're gonna end with this, the power of God is available to you and for you. Go with me to first, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse nine through 10. Paul is speaking about a weakness here that he can't seem to get over. Paul, if you don't know who he is, is the writer of most of the New Testament, a man chosen by God to take the gospel into the world. He says this in verse nine, but he said to me, he being God, but God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What is this power, friends? It is the power to overcome. The power to say that your situation will no longer own you. It is the power to overcome sin in your life and in this world. Yes, I said it, sin in your life and in this world. You can try to have accountability, you can read books, you can get counseling, you can get all the best medical treatment in the world. You cannot overcome the sin in your life without the power of God moving in your life through prayer. Unless you surrender, God, I am, for, for many of you in this room, you have never confessed, Jesus, I am a sinner in need of your grace. Forgive me, I wanna walk as your child. And for many of you who are Christians, when is the last time you've actually confessed Lord, I, forgive me for my pride. Forgive me for my lust. Forgive me when I said that in my, in my mind. Forgive me when I did this. Lord, I confess that I need you. And in that moment, the Bible says, you're forgiven because in Christ Jesus on the cross, your past, present, future, all of your sins are forgiven in him. The only way to overcome is through surrender. We see this in the life of Jesus. No one in this world lived with more power because no one lived with more surrender. The entire life of Jesus was a life of surrender. He surrendered all of his divine rights to come down to this broken and ugly world. And there on the cross, he surrendered his body, his life, beaten, stripped naked, spat on, in front of the whole world, he surrendered his life. I love the words of the, old sin, of the old hymn. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, because there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power in the blood of the Lamb. Many of you in prayer, I'm begging you, invite the power of God through prayer to overcome the sin in your life, to overcome the sin in this world. But we surrender in prayer. And what is this power that Paul is talking about? It's the power to stand strong in the Lord, to know that in all things, whatever your situation, listen, I would love to tell you that your situation can change. I would love to tell you, and we'll talk more about this in the series, but I don't know if it will. But I can tell you that in prayer and in power, you can live in the enduring eternal love of God to always know who you are and whose you are. I love the words of Tony Evans in his book, Kingdom Prayer. He says this, when you are tied into Christ and his love for you, listen, he creates the depths you need to receive the enormous amount of power God has to provide you through prayer. Every week I meet people, every week, every single week, and they unload their problems on me. And they're genuine. They want to know how it can be solved. And what I find is people would rather talk about their problems plan to fix them than to spend one moment in prayer. Listen, prayer is the answer to power. God can do more in 30 seconds than you and I could do in a lifetime, 30 seconds. And friends, the power that you need in your life, church, the power that we need is one honest, simple confession and prayer away. If we stay connected and we live in surrender to Jesus. What the world needs today is not churches clamoring for political power or competing for social status and influence. We don't need the church to lead the way in the pursuit of celebrity accolades and meaningless entertainment. What our broken world needs today and is desperate for is for a church that is filled with the prophetic power of God 
And what our churches need today is for the people of God, those who call themselves Christians, to run from an anemic and powerless faith and instead be consumed and be zealous for prayer. We must be devoted in our homes and in our gathering of God's people to seek the face of God. We must cry out to God to meet us in our weakness and to strengthen our inner being with his power. We must, in our personal lives, in our collective expression, settle for nothing less than a supernatural, dynamic, life-giving, humble, power-filled, faith-filled, God the Father glorifying, spirit transforming, Jesus becoming powerful life of prayer, which can only be done if we surrender to God now and every day. Church, we have a vision to see 1% of the Denver metro area gather to be a part of Life Heat. That's roughly 40,000 people. There's not enough money to do this. There's certainly not enough talent to do this. There's not enough charisma to do this. We can only do this. We can only reach this lost and broken city. We wanna see thousands of people go through our Made Alive formation process. We wanna see thousands of people gather for prayer. We wanna see families restored children on fire for Jesus, young people who see their work not as a means to make money, but as a means to make disciples. We wanna see every street and corner filled with the prophetic power of Jesus. And we cannot do it, we will not do it if we're not a church of prayer. We must be, we must fulfill the desire of Jesus to become a house of prayer. And from here on out, church, from here on out, the success of this church will be determined by the faithfulness of our prayer, individually and collectively? Are we a prayerful people? So every Wednesday night, we're gonna gather for prayer. And our prayer and our hope is that these expressions happen all over the city. So in five years, there's 100,000 people gathering all over the city on Wednesday nights seeking the face of God. I read a book when I was 21 years old and it changed my life, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. On page 22, Jim Simler wrote, I despaired at the thought that my life might slip by without ever seeing God show himself mightily on my behalf. I don't want another day to go by where I can rest my head and think, I did this in my own strength. I wanna live in desperation for God to move. I wanna live in the power of God. And my question to you, friends, is what would it take? What would it take for you to come to a place where you're willing to confess your weakness, where you're willing to confess your inability, I'm gonna ask for the prayer team to come up right now. They're gonna assemble the prayer team. There's nothing special about the prayer team. They're just men and women that love Jesus and love you and wanna pray with you. I'm gonna ask you to actually respond in a time of prayer. If you would feel the confidence, and I hope you do, to go up to them, to let them pray for you. If you wanna go with others, take others. Or if you wanna just turn to the person next to you and say, let's just pray together so I can confess my weakness and we can ask for the power of God to move here. And I want you, I'm gonna ask you, I'll take the first step in being vulnerable. The last three weeks, I've woken up every single morning, every morning without fail, with a deep sense of worry. And I have no idea where it's coming from, none. Just a deep sense that something is gonna happen today, something bad is gonna happen today. And so I sing this song, I pray and I sing the song that my dad used to sing. Something good is gonna happen to me. Something good is gonna happen to me. Something good is gonna happen to me. Jesus of Nazareth is passing my way. Sing this over and over again. So you can pray for me. But church, what would it take for us to become a house of prayer? A house that surrenders to the work of Jesus.